Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. This is a story about a time when I went on a courage test with some friends. I went to a small university in Tohoku a few years ago and lived alone, about 15 minutes away, by car. One evening while hanging out with four college buddies, one of them suggested we go on a test of courage. We were all up for it. We started off at this well-known spot, famous for people taking their own lives, a bridge. But nothing happened, so it was just boring and not at all scary. So we looked up another place on our phones. We found out about this old tunnel near my apartment up in the mountains, with rumors of a woman's ghost who died in a fire and the cries of a baby that could be heard sometimes. When we got there and started walking toward that tunnel, just getting near the entrance felt super creepy. The darkness inside the tunnel was intense. We played rock paper scissors to see who'd walk through to the end alone and come back first. The first one came back and said it was really freaky inside and I was already scared stiff. I was second, and when it was my turn, I could barely see with my phone's light. The tunnel was short, but the thought of something lurking to the side, just out of my vision, scared me. I tried not to think about it. After about five minutes, I was out on the other side and onto a forested part by the road, so I headed back. The third friend took over for me. After I got back, he went in, but, he didn't come out. Ten minutes passed, then fifteen. We started joking around about him, but by thirty minutes, we started to panic a bit, thinking he might be hurt or, something worse. We all went back to the tunnel, calling his name. We found him halfway through the tunnel, huddled and shaking, like nothing I'd ever seen before. This was the first time I'd seen anyone shaking like that, and it wasn't from the cold, the fear on his face sent a chill down our spines, so we quickly helped him out of there. We left and drove to a nearby convenience store. At the convenience store, with the light and normalcy returning color to his face, he finally shared why he was so terrified. He told us that when he was close to the tunnel's end, he saw a figure shrouded in shadow. But it wasn't just standing there. It was moving unnaturally fast, darting from one side of the tunnel to the other, like it was coming for him. It stopped just short of the light from his phone and disappeared, but he felt a cold breath on his neck and heard a whisper that chilled him to the core, though he couldn't make out the words. We didn't know what to believe, but the sheer terror in his eyes was enough to convince us not to stick around. I haven't gone back to any haunted spots since that night. About 20 years ago, I had an experience I still can't fully believe. None of my friends or family were into paranormal stuff, so I didn't really have anyone to help me interpret it. Back then, I was a college student, living a fairly aimless life without any goals or dreams. I wasn't in any clubs or social circles, I just drifted along lazily. The only thing I did was go for drives with my friends, K and S, who were as aimless as I was. After a while, even the drives got boring, so we started exploring abandoned roads for fun. Instead of sticking to main roads, we'd look for routes that had been forgotten, often cut off by newer roads or so narrow that we didn't know where they led. We didn't go on closed roads, but it felt adventurous enough. One day, Kay mentioned he'd found a good spot for our next outing. It was already past 2 p.m., but since S and I had no plans, we decided to go right then, in Kay's car. The place was about a 30-minute drive from our university, down a winding mountain road. We turned onto a narrow path, branching off a more traveled road. It was overgrown with weeds and littered with stones and branches. No one seemed to use it anymore. The road led to a dead end after about 100 meters. Is that all? I asked, disappointed. But Kay pointed off to the side with a smug grin. Look at that. I expected to see a concrete retaining wall blocking us, but instead, there was just a flimsy section of wire mesh. Behind it, the road seemed to continue. Kay had brought wire cutters with him and snipped the mesh so we could get through. 
I didn't feel like we were doing anything wrong since we planned to reattach the mesh on our way back. We were surprised that the road beyond the mesh was in decent condition, cleaner than the one we'd just driven on. We carefully drove down it for about five minutes before coming across a tunnel. It was built like an old brick aqueduct with a hollowed archway, and it was wide enough to fit the car. As we passed through, the asphalt became rougher, scattered with loose stones. Suddenly, S shouted, Hey, stop! Look at that! He pointed behind us, back toward the tunnel we'd just come through. There, right at the tunnel exit, was a Tori gate, the type you see, at Shinto shrines. The gate was positioned so that you'd pass under it, without realizing it as you came through the tunnel. We felt uneasy, but decided to keep going. After all, we'd already come this far. After another 500 meters, the paved road suddenly stopped, as if a line had been drawn across it. From there, a dirt road continued. Oddly, there were two small shrines positioned on either side of this boundary line, one on the asphalt and one on the dirt. By this point, I was a mixture of curious, anxious, and excited. We decided to press on. As we continued, I realized the road was unusually clean, without wheel ruts or fallen trees, even though it was supposed to be abandoned. Eventually, we came to an open area that looked like an empty plain or abandoned rice paddies. The sky was clear, cloudless, and the view was breathtaking. But something felt off. Where exactly are we? I wondered. Ahead, we saw a small, dark building, which grew larger as we approached. It looked like a massive thatched structure, as big as a school gym. The building seemed well-kept, though ancient, without any signs of wear. We parked and stepped out. The air was cool and refreshing, with no wind, no sounds of birds, just an eerie, complete silence. Curious, I suggested we take a look inside, and Kay agreed. S, however, decided to walk around the building's exterior. The door was heavy but unlocked. Inside, it smelled musty and old. Hello? I called, but there was no answer. The dim interior revealed wooden shelves against the walls, though they were empty, and a sliding door on the left wall. There was nothing else, just an open, vaulted space that extended all the way up to the ceiling. I felt compelled to explore further and opened the sliding door. The room beyond was surprisingly bright, lit by numerous small windows high up. However, something about this room felt strange. It was enormous, about the size of a gym, with five thick, wooden pillars spaced evenly throughout the space. Each pillar was massive, around 3 meters in diameter and stretching over 10 meters high. In the middle of these pillars, I noticed something nailed to one of them, a talisman-like strip of paper covered in symbols. It was held in place by long, pointed nails. Upon closer inspection, I realized with horror that attached to the pillar were dozens, maybe hundreds, of dried human ears, nailed in place along with the talisman. The ears at the top looked fresher than the ones lower down. Panic took over, and Kay and I bolted out of the building. We dashed around the side to find S, and when we got to the back, we saw him standing there, staring. Behind the building stretched rows upon rows of small wooden platforms, each with two or three candles, flickering on top, continuing all the way to the horizon. What is this place? I wondered in terror. S snapped out of his daze when he saw us, and pointed out something none of us had noticed. Where's the sun? he asked. The sky was uniformly bright, but the sun was nowhere to be seen. We hadn't heard a single sound, not a bird or a breeze, the entire time we'd been there. We knew we had to leave. Calmly, we led us back to the car, though the building's door was now closed, even though I was sure we'd left it open. Kay drove us back along the road we'd come in on, and we eventually made it back to the main highway just as the sun was setting. We never experienced any strange phenomena or bad luck afterward, but we all remember that day clearly. Later on, we noticed the entrance to that narrow road had been sealed with a heavy gate. Even if it hadn't been, none of us ever intended to go back.
Five years ago, I was transferred from Saitama to Atomy due to a company change. I'd never been to Atomy before and was actually looking forward to it, though it wasn't a huge deal or anything. As soon as I arrived, I stopped by the new office to greet everyone and talk about the job. My new manager gave me the afternoon off, so I decided to take a walk and explore the area. A co-worker mentioned that the night view in Atomy was something special, so later on, around 11 p.m., I went for a drive to check it out. Atomy is full of hills, and I was driving around them, admiring the lights and figuring I'd eventually find my way back. But as I kept going, I ended up pretty lost. I found myself approaching a short tunnel, maybe about 30 meters long. Something about it didn't feel right to me. I'm not into ghost stories, and I'd never had any strange experiences, but there was something about this tunnel that made me hesitate. I didn't want to go back up the hill, though, so I decided to drive through it. Halfway into the tunnel, I stopped the car without even realizing why. And that's when I saw them, five or six kids standing in the tunnel. They were playing with rocks, piling them up, and kicking them around. I was completely stunned. It was after midnight, and there were kids in the middle of this dark tunnel. Fear hit me like a hammer, I was frozen, heart racing, hands shaking. And then, one of the kids turned toward me and smiled. It was a huge, unsettling smile, his teeth bared almost too wide, and that's when I finally screamed. I threw the car into reverse, backing up as fast as I could, scraping the door against the tunnel wall and sending sparks flying. I somehow managed to make a U-turn and sped back toward the entrance. I eventually made it back to my dorm, but I didn't sleep a wink that night. The next day at the office, I told one of the locals about the tunnel and the kids. Her face went pale as I described it. She explained that the tunnel was the entrance to Nechikagoare, a spot infamous for being associated with people taking their own lives. She said driving through there could have been very bad news. I was just relieved I hadn't gone all the way through, and glad that there hadn't been any other cars on my way back up the hill. That was the first, and definitely the last, time I'd had a scare like that. I think it was around Isahara, in Kanagawa Prefecture. Have you ever heard of the Nanasawa Tunnel? I think the real name might be Yamakami Tunnel. About two years ago, when I was a sophomore in college, I was living in Itsuji City, Kanagawa. There were many haunted places around, like abandoned hospitals, and so on. There wasn't much to do, so I used to go there with my friends for a good test of courage. I would visit places rumored to be haunted. One of the rumors I heard about Nanasawa Tunnel was that if you go there on a rainy night, you might see a woman in a white dress. I think that's how it went, but my memory's a bit hazy. I like scary places, but I'd never actually seen a ghost or anything like that, until then. That day, my friend A, who had suggested going to Nanasawa Tunnel, along with B, C, and I, who usually hung out together, decided to go. I drove. We bought flashlights at a convenience store on the way, then followed the directions that A had given us. We drove up the mountain road, and I think it was around 2 a.m. when the lights around us grew dim, and the road started to narrow. The road became unpaved and rough, and we didn't see any other cars. Honestly, I was nervous and wanted to turn back, but I kept quiet and kept driving. Suddenly, B said, huh? I looked where he was pointing and saw what looked like an abandoned car on the side of the road, hidden by the grass. It's just an abandoned car, isn't it? A said. No, there were people in it. Didn't you see them? B was clearly freaked out, but neither C nor I had seen anything. The darkness seemed to create a creepy atmosphere, but C and I managed to calm B down. Although I was shaken inside, I kept driving, and soon we came across what looked like a gate. The no trespassing bar was raised, so I continued on. After a bit more driving, the road opened up to a small parking lot on the left, and we saw the tunnel ahead. It was smaller than I'd expected, about the width of a single car. The inside of the tunnel was pitch black, so I pulled over in the clearing. But when I turned off the engine, my heart almost stopped. 
The gas tank, which was nearly full when we arrived, was now almost empty. I told the others that they must have seen it wrong, though I was scared too, so I just assumed I'd misread it. We got out of the car and approached the tunnel, and though it was lightly raining, the atmosphere around us felt increasingly ominous. B looked like he wanted to turn back, and honestly, so did I. A, who was the bravest, quickly went inside with a flashlight, with C following close behind. B and I trailed behind. The inside of the tunnel was darker and creepier than I'd expected. I'm not psychic at all, but I could feel this wasn't good. A seemed unfazed, laughing and pointing out graffiti on the walls. I think we were about halfway through the tunnel when, suddenly, Ace flashlight started blinking before it went out entirely. Whoa, he shouted, and then dashed toward the entrance as fast as he could. Strangely, even in the darkness, the entrance had a faint light, and all four of us managed to get back to the car. A, who'd seemed confident before, now looked pale. Shall we head back? C suggested. But then A said, hey, is there something behind me? None of us really understood what he meant. Didn't you guys hear anything? A asked. We shook our heads, and he continued, you didn't hear anything the whole time we were running back? They were chasing us. I hadn't heard anything, and neither had B or C. Apparently, only A could hear it. He said the voice kept getting closer and closer, and just before we reached the car, he heard it whisper in his ear. Oh, he mimicked, his voice half crying. We were all completely freaked out. I couldn't even look in the rearview mirror as I drove away. And then, suddenly, I saw the gate's bar in front of me, the same bar that had been up when we arrived. It was now down. My heart nearly leapt out of my chest. I got out and ran to raise the bar, then hurried back to my car door, which was still open. As I climbed in, I noticed a white plastic umbrella on the step below the door. I hadn't seen anything like it before. Why an umbrella? Shaken, I drove down the mountain as fast as I could. After everything, the four of us went back to A's room to rest. While we were heading upstairs, C suddenly shouted, Whoa! What's wrong with this? He pointed to the back of A's shirt, which had been sliced open lengthwise. All four of us fell silent and stayed awake until dawn. The next morning, we parted ways, and I went home. Later that evening, I got a call from C. Apparently, A had a fever, and his back was swollen. When I got to his place, it was groaning in bed. The swelling on his back was the size of a fist. I'd never seen anything like it before, so we decided it was best to take him to the hospital. C and I supported him as we went to the emergency room. We contacted A's parents, and they said they'd be there the next day. The doctor said it would need to be monitored, so he stayed in the hospital. C, looking pale, muttered, I wonder if it's because of that thing from yesterday, I could only nod. I was eventually transferred to a university hospital and ended up staying there for nearly two months. The cause was unknown, but he was given antibiotics. The day after we went to the tunnel, B fell off his motorcycle and broke his leg. I also sprained my ankle three days later, though that was just my own carelessness. I don't mean to blame everything on the tunnel, but there was definitely something off about that place with so many rumors around it. As an aside, when I visited A about two weeks after he was hospitalized, he seemed calmer. The swelling on his back had grown to the size of a child's face. I half-joked that it might turn into a face, but thankfully, I was wrong. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.